about the drug discovery program that we've been working uh, here for about three plus years and how that's led to um, multiple lead hits in uh, multiple therapeutic areas. So we are a venture-backed um, biopharma company. Uh, we also have um, uh, grants from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. And our primary strategy is to um, develop secreted proteins uh, into therapeutic agents for the regeneration of tissues in uh, aging-related diseases. And so well, the reason why we're focusing on secreted proteins is because um, they are the body's natural way of uh, communicating between cell to cell, tissue to tissue, modulating its function, as well as maintaining homeostasis. And so during aging and, and in a disease state, um, that homeostasis and function is, and communication gets perturbed, whether it's skewed towards uh, a pathological condition. And so our aim is to be able to restore uh, homeostasis and function by uh, putting back uh, the proper communications by uh, introducing uh, pro-regenerative uh, secreted proteins that we identify for a specific cell type and in a specific tissue in a context for a specific uh, disease. And the, the foundation of this work has been done by our CEO and co-founder, Dr. Youssef, during her graduate work in which she identified that a subfraction of uh, um, protein secreted by embryonic stem cells, but not differentiated cells, can promote um, regeneration in multiple tissues, including uh, muscle fiber uh, generation as well as in the brain. And we've uh, adapted that and uh, extended that to uh, different tissue types, including in the bone. And so why secreted proteins now? And why hasn't there been uh, a lot of work done uh, previously? Uh, the main uh, limitation has been that there are thousands of proteins um, in which the identification and characterization and isolation uh, are not trivial and very difficult in some instances, as well as there's that tens of thousands of indication. And so mapping which secreted protein to which therapeutic target has been very difficult. And unlike in uh, using small molecules, um, a high throughput screen, even in a subfraction of these pro uh, proteins is um, not feasible due to the fact that uh, uh, scaling up and production of these proteins uh, is very difficult. And so the way that we are um, tackling and overcoming uh, these technical limitations is that we are reducing the complexity of these proteins from uh, several thousands to a thousand or less using a process in which we identify which proteins has uh, pro-regenerative potential through what we call library creation. And I'll go a little bit into how that happens. Um, and then by selecting a um, more narrow therapeutic um, area, we can also reduce the complexity and by also rank ordering, uh, and that allows us to not uh, force us to do uh, a very large combinatorial screen. So we've mainly been focusing on um, uh, developing and identifying uh, targets for the muscle. But as we are extending to new therapeutic areas, including in the brain and the heart and in the bone, um, we're, our ultimate goal is to create a map of regenerative protein biology. And what that means is that not only will we be able to identify which particular secreted protein uh, has a target in a specific tissue and it has a specific function, but then at the systems biology level, we'll be able to tell how that affects the entire body in itself because uh, a tissue is not in a vacuum. And so when you introduce something uh, systemically or even locally, it can affect surrounding tissues. So uh, we are, um, our ultimate goal is to create all uh, a wider uh, understanding of how proteins and signaling affect um, cell state and in disease. But in order to do that, uh, we had to build a platform to be able to identify what these targets are and what their function is in, in, in the tissue. And so we've been starting with uh, in muscle, and, and this is a breakdown of how our platform works. It's, we call it JuveNet. It's a multimodal uh, machine-enhanced platform. And what it does is um, uh, we break it down into three parts, which I'll be spending the rest of my talk going over. Uh, but at a high and broad level, um, it reduces the complexity of the um, pool of secreted candidates, as I mentioned earlier, through um, uh, library generation and through rank ordering. And then we do we use machine learning models uh, and deep uh, learning to enhance and accelerate the process of high throughput screening as well as in vivo target validation. 
And so how do we reduce the complexity? So, uh, and it's kind of, it's exemplified here uh, in a very simple uh, schematic where we have secreted proteins from two cell types. So in this case, it's stem cells and a fibroblast. And what we do, call it effect testing. It's essentially just a phenotypic screen uh, as it correlates to, uh, as a readout for uh, the pathology of the disease. So in this case, the stem cell secretome had a positive effect, whereas the fibroblast had a neutral negative effect. So by comparing the composition of these two pools, we'll be able to, able to identify um, the unique proteins inside the stem cells, which will then potentially have um, this uh, therapeutic effect. So we do that through um, uh, labeling uh, and uh, mass spec proteomics, where we compare the relative abundance of the two um, secretomes. And this is a simplistic cartoon, but we do that in many conditions across uh, many different uh, uh, permutations and that allow us to eventually create this pool of what we call now our Juve1K or 1000 proteins. So this is a workflow of how that process works. Um, so in this case, we had stem cells and we had differentiated cells. And then after mass spec, we quantify the number of peptides and then we collapse that down to the protein level and then we do clustering. So this is a heat map clustering, looking at uh, uh, different samples within our stem, uh, stem cell secretome and the differentiated cells to see that they cluster together, but also that there's a differential expression. Um, which is good because we saw a different differential effect in our testing. And here's this is a PCA plot to further uh, emphasize that and where the stem cell pool are more homogeneous, but they are uh, uh, significantly uh, compared to the differentiated uh, cells. So what you can do from that is we do pathway analysis and we kind of get down deep into the weeds and then a look at first what cellular functions it's modulating um, uh, differentially, as well as looking at that transcriptional network. And one of the ways we sanity check that uh, our analysis pipeline is to identify uh, the pathways that are uh, inherent to each of these cell types. So for the stem cells, we're looking for pluripotency networks. So from the signaling that we see from our secreted proteins, we can we are identifying able to identify NANOG and OG4, which are the two master regulators of the stem cell state. And so that gives us credence to go on and kind of look for other pathways that we are hoping to modulate in the issue or the cell type and the disease that we're interested in. And, and, a, and another in a broader uh, way, we can do a, just a differential expression uh, comparison. We're looking for through a, a cutoff, uh, a certain number of proteins that are enriched in one pool, in this case, it's the stem cells, and use that as part of our pro-regenerative um, uh, complex. And some of the proteins that we have identified in, in this study are listed here. And so we've been focusing primarily on stem cells and their differentiated counterparts and analyze several different cell lines and even pluripotent stem cells. Um, but we are expanding that to uh, different secret tomes, so different cell types, different lineages, and different... Uh, um, adult stem cells, because we believe that um, uh, different stem adult changes um, have different uh, compositions that mediate different effects. And so uh, quantifying and identifying uh, what are inside of each of these different cell types will be able to have a stronger uh, effect across a broader range of their therapies. So from in the same way, we'll do effect testing, but this time we'll do it in a different tissue using uh, different phenotypes as each tissue or cell type uh, will require a different uh, phenotypic assay uh, as it relates to the broad area of the disease that, uh, that surrounded uh, that tissue. And so we can, uh, then we'll do uh, comparative mass spec and then in the same way as I described earlier with a stem cell, uh, we'll be able to identify which of these uh, pro-regenerative proteins are unique to the fractions that have a positive effect. And so that's how we reduce the complexity from several thousands to a thousand. But a thousand is still a lot to screen, particularly in that how to get your hands on a thousand uh, secret proteins. And so we've been working on developing a uh, machine learning model. We call it PQNet. It's an ensemble model for protein candidate identification. 
Uh, ensemble just means it's just a model of models. So like it's broken down to different models. Each of them have a rank ordering weight. And then when you sum them all or, or do a weighted distribution, uh, it creates a list of probabilities, uh, likelihood for having a positive effect, a therapeutic effect. So how we um, can look at it is, um, so in this case, if we're interested in osteoarthritis, um, the first thing we do is uh, curate a small list of uh, true positive and negatives, uh, and then we run it through our QSAR model. So for those who aren't uh, familiar with QSAR, it's quantitative structure activity relationship. It's very, um, it's commonly used in small molecule analysis. So we've adapted that to do uh, for protein analysis. So we've incorporated a variety of different features. I'll go over in the next slide. But essentially what it does is it takes the features of a specific, of, a pro, of all the proteins in our pool, and then it uses as a guide, a small set of uh, like positive and negatives that we can either find in the literature or we test ourselves, and then stratifies them across like whether it thinks, you know, these are similar, so they should probably have a similar effect, and then no effect or, or negative effect, and then creates a list of candidates. So this model is very um, disease or tissue agnostic. And, and so we built it that way is because we want to be able to translate the um, predictions to across different therapeutic areas. But we aren't ignorant to the fact that, um, in, especially in certain therapeutic areas, there's been decades of really good work done. So we want to leverage that by uh, using natural language processing to curate the text that's been done and so that we can help further inform this model. So it's not starting from um, like a bot, uh, unbiased uh, native state. So going back to the QSAR model, so this is the features I was mentioning. So uh, overall, there's over 20,000 different features within our models. Um, these are the broad categories that, uh, uh, that are comprised of it. So the, the most obvious ones you're probably thinking about is the structural uh, features. Um, some of the things we look at is how evolutionary conservative is. Uh, uh, we look at the receptor expression as well as some of the cell biology in terms of its localization and some of its function. We also add in disease modifying features, what we call it. Uh, so as we test the effect of these proteins and different cell types for different phenotypes, we add it to the data because we believe that adding this data will help um, create a more specific uh, prediction for a specific, for different tissues and different diseases. And so, um, and this is our uh, natural language processing model. So the idea is that uh, we uh, take the text from the science, uh, from research and medical repositories, extrapolates entities such as the genes or the proteins, uh, the pathways that gets mentioned, and then the disease, disease pathology and some of the common things that are known about it and create an association. And then that can be grouped together, generally known as like a network, a directed network. And so that allows us to when we feed in our rank order from our QSAR models to be able to identify, well, does that protein uh, have involved anything involved in uh, a specific disease? If yes, uh, and if it has, it's been shown to have a positive effect and that one potentially could be interesting. If it's uh, been shown to have a negative effect then it kind of goes down the list and you can imagine this kind of helps us to better fine tune uh, our ranking so that we don't necessarily need to go through the entire list of thousand and so that we can uh, identify hits in a more rapid uh, and at a higher rate to uh, move our pipeline along. And so this is some of the things that we're working on and developing in relation to um, some of the outputs of our model. Um, this model has primarily been uh, built upon a lot of good work in the, uh, uh, in the field of, uh, by Google and uh, other people. So it's been uh, really useful to be able to leverage a lot of what's been done uh, in the tech world and applying it to uh, research. And so at the end of the day, so this is kind of, uh, this is a validation, but it kind of shows you what the output of our PQNet model is providing us. So we, we feed in um, tissue, uh, therapeutic tissue uh, of interest, uh, some candidates and looking, and then we ask it to identify a distribution of probabilities uh, for a certain proteins. And so for our validation, we use a, an example for which we uh, validated some hits. So we had a couple dozen examples here, 12 of which works, 12 didn't work. And so we then ran it through our PQNet model and look for the probability. So the proteins are in the same order in the left graph and the right graph. 
and we just uh, distribute across the same probability. You can see that the ones that work generally are higher than the ones that, are, that don't work. And, and so that helps us in terms of, we can just take the chunk of the top 10% or so, and then test those. And then we kind of go down the list until we reach a certain uh, critical mass of hits that we feel confident will be sampled enough to move on to um, lead optimization. But that's in a nutshell of how, how our uh, PQNet model works. And, and it translates to, not, uh, to different tissues as we just need to modify a few parameters. It's using the same architecture every time. So that's how we reduce the complexity, um, as I mentioned. And now uh, from the rank candidates, we move that to high throughput screening where we heavily utilize uh, machine learning to increase the throughput uh, of our pipeline. Uh, we mainly use imaging-based uh, screening. So uh, in the muscle, we are interested in uh, an assay in which we fluorescently labeled the cell nuclei, um, muscle regeneration by mice and heavy chain, and the proliferating cells you can see here. Um, but the staining process and even imaging of the fluorescent signal itself is time consuming and expensive. And so um, we adapted a model that uses semantic uh, segmentation to be able to just take in a bright field image as an input and predict uh, whether there's a fluorescently labeled nuclei, uh, mycin heavy chain, or a proliferating uh, cell. Um, it's based on a pixel level prediction in which there is, um, uh, at every position in the image, it identifies whether that um, uh, image has a fluorescently labeled any of these channels. And so it's a multitasking model. Um, after that, we can uh, re-array uh, uh, the predictions into an image back here and do a comparison of how well it performs. And you can see here as an example. But on a global level, um, at the pixel level, we, uh, this is the AUC for the pixels, and then we have a very high accuracy. And even beyond that, uh, what we do with these images, we do segmentation for the objects and the areas, the shape and all that. And even at the object level uh, for each of these channels, we have a very high accuracy. Of the, so this helps us in that uh, we no longer are limited by uh, doing staining or doing fluorescent imaging we, and allows us to image multiple times and not kill the cells so we don't need it as a terminal endpoint. So this is an example of uh, one of our validation assays, kind of shows uh, how it works in a real world setting, so to speak. And so this is like a fluorescently labeled predicted image. So I put back like some pseudo uh, colors. It's not normally how it's outputted, but for presentation purposes, for people to get an idea of what uh, it's outputting. For the fluorescent image, I also, uh, for consistency, thresholded all of the intensity uh, are more, uh, have a larger deviation and that's represented across the different uh, predictions as well. So this uh, provide us uh, evidence that our model is performing well and uh, can be uh, utilized uh, as using only bright field images. And so that leads, uh, the next step is uh, for our in vivo target validation. So animal studies are very long, and but also the uh, image or the sample processing and analysis can also be really long. And so we want, we're able to, at least for this, for now, shorten the, uh, sample uh, processing and analysis step through machine learning. And the way that we've been doing that is through uh, uh, one way is by adapting the bright field image that we see in vitro that worked well to our muscle quantification assay, in which we're after um, a study where we're looking for uh, either following an injury or a long term experiment, we're looking for. Uh, muscle regeneration or muscle size, we use fluorescently labeled uh, markers to uh, identify those and then segment and do the analysis. And so we adapted that same architecture and to do the prediction. And so this is the rock curve for that. Uh, basically, it uh, performs really well. So this was good for us on two folds. At first, it uh, allowed us to now um, have the option to do a bright field prediction of fluorescently labeled images but also it uh, validates that our architecture is translatable to different uh, phenotypes and different, even different tissues or different types of data. And so um, uh, it's good for us to validate that so that we can translate it. And then there's the part where we have to analyze the data. So this process is normally done through hand counting or through even a semi-automated fashion 
which can still be time consuming and um, error prone. And so we develop a, an algorithm, we call it Artica. It essentially uh, identifies all the regenerating fibers. We can even identify fiber types and the cross-sectional area. So how big the area is uh, in terms of that, it's a correlation to how much muscle growth is, uh, is, um, has undergone between two, the two conditions. And then that calculates the phenotypic improvements. This is a segmentation of that outputs all of the intermediate data so that we can uh, go back and sanity check to make sure that the algorithm is working correctly. But more importantly, it outputs a phenotypic um, uh, analysis for whether we see an improvement or not. And we're also very interested in using um, animal behavior such as um, open field uh, studies or novel object recognitions to understand how our molecules are modulating uh, neurative uh, or cognitive function in rodents. And uh, we adapted a um, model that uh, has been shown to work really well in time series uh, images uh, to track different uh, positions as well as poses of a mouse and their behavior. Um, uh, and here is a trajectory mapping. So that essentially is looking at uh, the movement of a mouse across a certain amount of time to get um, uh, for every frame uh, likelihood estimate. So we are able to filter out uh, frames that we don't believe uh, the model is performing well. Uh, but as a validation, uh, we first looked at the tracking movement of the young and the age mice. And we expected the young mice to uh, travel a further distance in the age, and that's what we see. And even in the age, we expected some sort of variability because we always have, there's always some outliers in where some of the age mice behave as though they're young. And in, we, in this cohort, we do see that in a couple of other mice. So that uh, shows that um, our model is uh, working as expected. And so I hope you guys got a good sense of how our pipeline, um, our drug discovery uh, platform has um, allowed us to expedite our pipelines for neuromuscular. Um, we've been able to identify uh, hits that we validated and uh, are in one uh, area moving to a preclinical and cl clinical development. We've also been able to uh, establish a scalar program where we've identified hits and moving on to uh, in vivo target validation using a single secretome and one library. But as I mentioned uh, earlier in my talk, uh, we are expanding the number of secretomes, uh, getting a broader effect of different uh, pathways, expanding our library, and expanding our therapeutic areas of interest. And so we've moved on to things we're interested in our metabolic fibrosis and inflammatory diseases and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, so with that, I hope you got an understanding of how um, our pipeline works and how we've been able to integrate uh, machine learning into wet lab biology. And that's how helped us um, overcome limitations and develop therapeutics that were otherwise um, very difficult to do uh, in previously. So with that, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk.